Hello, lovely people. Today we are talking about the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. I've kind of missed you guys. I've been a little burnt out on content creation. Um, you know how it gets sometimes. It just feels like you're constantly on the go and feeling a little uninspired. But here we are. It's October. Spooky season. And it's a great time to watch horror movies. So for this video, rather than just review one film, I watched all of the Freddy Krueger fil films. All of the Freddy Krueger films. So you get to hear about a total of nine films and one TV series. So you're welcome. <laughs> That's a pretty respectable number of films, really. Friday the 13th and the Halloween franchise both have about 12 each. Of course, Halloween has a new addition to the franchise out this month. And I've heard rumors that there's a new Nightmare on Elm Street movie coming out at some point, but its release date is unconfirmed. So I don't even know if they've started, you know, principal filming on it or whatever, but there are rumors. So to begin at the beginning, these films are kind of, some of them are kind of old. So there will be spoilers. I don't think spoilers matter all that much with slasher films, but you might so yeah there will be some spoilers i'm not going to spoil the entire movie or anything like that but obviously by speaking about you know the next film in the series it kind of spoils the film before a little bit and that kind of thing so um just so you're aware anyway so the nightmare on elm street films started in 1984 with a nightmare on elm street it started a cycle of films dropping every year or two until 1991. These films all essentially begin a little bit after the narrative ending of the previous one. Then we get Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which is very 90s and a sort of reboot, and then nothing until 2003's Freddy vs. Jason, which I have talked about before when I talked about the Friday the 13th franchise, so I will put a link below to that if you guys want to you know, know more about that franchise or whatever. Uh, we also have the 2010, basically, flop, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and finally, a TV series. So in total, these films have grossed $472 million at the box office. It's pretty respectable. So let's dive in. To have a teen slasher franchise... You have to have a killer. Uh, Freddy Krueger perhaps needs no introduction, but to get us started, Freddy is the spirit of a child killer who visits teenagers in their dreams. It's kind of like the notion that if you fall asleep and you dream of falling in your dream, if you hit the ground before you wake up, the rumor goes that you will die in real life. And so Freddy is able to murder his victims in elaborate ways in their dreams and their injuries happen in real waking life. He has a melted face, destroyed by burns, he wears a jaunty red and green sweater, brown fedora, and has a leather glove on his right hand with knife blades attached to the fingers. In life, Freddy welded the glove himself and used it as a deadly weapon, and he uses it in dreams. Though he is able to use, utilize dream imagery and sometimes to use that more often to create vivid or outlandish deaths. Wes Craven wanted to create a memorable weapon for his character and felt like Claws touched on a primal fear for the audience. He was inspired by his cat clawing the couch, which that's kind of a nightmare in itself. Anyway, Freddy is almost always played by Robert England, who without the makeup looks like a college professor and in fact has played one in Urban Legend, which is a fun cameo in that film. England was classically trained at RADA and worked on the stage and screen before taking on the role of Freddy, which changed the course of his career. He has said that the face was in, the face makeup was inspired somewhat by Nosferatu and Lon Chaney movies, with him adopting the poise and gait inspired by James Cagney. In the films, Freddy is initially a spooky, nightmarish character, but over the course of the films, he becomes more witty, more punny, a bit more funny, he gets more lines, so his character evolves in that direction. And he also uses more physicality and sight gags. Honestly, England seems to have more and more fun playing him as time goes on, and the situations get more silly, but more on that later. 
I read somewhere that England feels that Freddy, as a fear, represents the neglect that children feel from their parents. Which is interesting when you watch these films with that in mind. The kids in the movies are often kept in the dark and have their fears and experiences once needs sidelined or ignored. They may even feel that the whole situation started with their parents not watching over them adequately. Is one way of looking at it. The character does very much embody our fears in our dreams. Fears are out from our subconscious and the notion of having a nightmare that you can't wake up from. Amusingly, Wes Craven took the name Freddy Krueger from the school bully in his from his own childhood. Freddy was initially set to be a child molester. There was a lot of cases of this in California at the time. And so this was changed to being a child serial killer in the film. Though, in my opinion, it does kind of feel implied in some ways at times that he was a child molester as well. There was a, I was going to say like a rash or like a, a bunch of cases of child molestation at the time. And they ended up changing it because it felt too much like exploitation and just bad taste. So that's the reason for changing him to just being a child killer. I mean, just being a child killer, but you know what I mean. Wes Craven spoke about an inspiration for the film that's really interesting and also very tragic. Without going into too much detail for fear of kind of getting the facts a little bit wrong, like this is something I would have to do some heavy research into, but there was a certain demographic of refugees that left Laos after the Vietnam War to escape persecution and genocide because they had aided the US, so they needed to, to get out. And what they went through was beyond horrific. So a lot of them started dying in their sleep, often while afflicted with horrible nightmares. And this phenomenon has been labeled sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome because the cause of death has never actually been explained. So that idea of a nightmare killing you, that's where the inspiration came from. If you want to make it a fun night, you can take a shot <laughs> whenever you see any of these little motifs in these films. Some of these things are just there in the first film, but take on a significant in later films as kind of being symbolic. So number one, the skipping song. This is really eerie. It's little girls singing this song. Like little girls singing songs in horror movies is just creepy. So <laughs> number two, a little girl or two in a frothy, lacy puff sleeve dress. That's another motif. Number three, a really over-the-top theme song that's quintessentially kind of bad and very 80s. Number four, the house. This one is sometimes the house itself or sometimes a drawing of it, a model of it. It's Nancy's house in the first movie. And I think this is kind of a bit annoying because the house is Nancy's house. It's not significant to Freddy. But it's a motif in the first film and it ends up coming back a lot over the course of the film. So it's fine. Not all that much happens there in the first film, but it's a notable location and it just becomes like a symbol in the series of films. Number five, a creepy factory or industrial imagery or locations. This is Freddy's classic ambience. He spent a lot of time in boiler rooms or ironworks or something. So that's where he seems to live. In the afterlife. Number six, different in each film, you'll always get an interesting play on dream imagery, perhaps running and the floor turning to mud or interesting proportions, that kind of thing. The creativity and effects in these sequences are often really clever and very well realized. And number seven, bonus points for any 80s fashion moments. This is not a true trope since not all the films are in the 80s, but you can just tip a glass to 80s class if you ask me. This is the one that started it all. This film was written and directed by Wes Craven and set in Springwood, Ohio, the kind of small, safe suburban place that would be very familiar to viewers and probably still is kind of everywhere America. 
It's a place where you would feel safe, know your neighbors, nothing really happens, very much a normality. A lot of towns have an Elm Street as well, which I, I kind of like that. Often you'll drive around and you'll see an Elm Street and it'll immediately make you think of this film. We meet a group of teens at the local high school who have all been having nightmares about the same strange man with a glove that has knives for fingers. During a sleepover at Tina's while her parents are away, Tina is brutally killed in her sleep after having sex with her boyfriend. The special effects in this scene stand up so well as she's thrown around the room by an unseen force and her boyfriend can't wake her up. It's startling and unsettling as she's killed in her sleep. He goes on the run because it kind of looks like he did it. And meanwhile, Nancy is noticing that what happens in her dreams about the killer have real world results. She understands that they have to stay awake. Her mother takes her to a sleep disorder clinic, which is an idea that will be used again in this series. And as Nancy tries to talk to her mother about what's happening, she's mostly ignored. Eventually, when Nancy confronts her with Freddy's hat that she was able to bring through into the real waking world, her mother admits that she does know something. Years before, Freddy was terrorizing the town, killing children. When he was arrested and brought to trial, he was able to get off on a technicality, and the parents decided to take matters into their own hands, and they ended up burning him alive. Nancy realizes Kruger is back to get revenge on the people who killed him by murdering their children in their dreams. She comes up with a plan to confront Freddy, realizing that if she can bring him into the waking world, he will be less powerful. And also that a lot of his power comes from people's fear of him. If you're not afraid of him, he can't hurt you. But none of this does she realize before more people that she loves are killed. This film has some amazingly clever imagery in the dream sequences and plays with the idea of trying to stay awake and not being able to of the characters thinking they're awake initially and not being able to wake themselves up. And it works really well. This one is probably, arguably the best one, in my opinion, in the sense of being a good, well-made and genuinely scary horror film with an original concept. <laughs> of course, a bad horror franchise entry has its own joys and should not be dismissed just for not actually being a good film. That would be missing the point. Freddy, in this film is relatively a more restrained presence. In later films, the death becomes more elaborate and more cartoonish. He has more lines and it gets pretty crazy and cheesy, but more on that later. John Saxon is here playing Nancy's father, who happens to be a cop, and he goes on to appear in a few of the films in this sequence. He's pretty game, pretty up for getting into the horror tropes and things. I think that's really cool. This film did amazingly well and has been considered an iconic film since it came out. I think this is probably my favorite in the series. As I mentioned, there is another one that I really like as well. That's kind of vies for, for being a favorite. It was made for 1.1 million and made 57 million. Because this is one of the first films from New Line Cinema, that studio became known as the house that Freddie built. It really put them on the film industry map. And a little fact for you, this one was produced by Robert Shea, whose sister is Scream Queen Lynn Shea, an actor whose enthusiasm for horror I really enjoy. She appears in this film as a teacher at the school. Star Power, Johnny Depp's film debut, and he's really good in this film. Heather Lankenkamp as Nancy makes an excellent and very watchable lead as well. Her hair has some enviable volume as well. I didn't see her in much outside of this film, though she was in a TV series Midnight Club that's like a recent series, and she's a voice in the new My Little Pony. Uh, she's Dazzle Feather, if anybody wanted to know that. I did find out a little tidbit about her when I was just looking up the background. She did this film and she did a TV series in the 80s, and then she actually left the country because she had a stalker after her, and that was... The only thing she could do was just go to another country and start over. And I think that's really tragic. Best death in this film. I think the death of Nancy's boyfriend is really the one that always stays with me. That's Johnny Depp's character. It's the way the movie lets you know he can't stay awake and his parents refuse to listen to Nancy when she calls. So there's this kind of build of like 
no one's coming to save him. And yeah, then what we see is Freddy's hands pulling him down into the bed. It's not that gruesome, but then there's just blood. There's so much blood. And they had a really fun time with that effect. But really, it's not so much what you see of this killing, but what your mind fills in from the EMT and police reaction to the crime scene. It's really excellent filmmaking. Also, special mention to the final death. Freddy pulls Nancy's mom through this like little small window in the front door. And it's really obviously a mannequin. And I just kind of love that. It's just such a cheesy little ending moment. This time, Wes Craven was not the writer or director. Instead, we have Jack Shoulder directing and David Chaskin writing. The film is set five years later, and Jesse Walsh, played by Mark Patton, is a teenager whose family has moved into Nancy's former home, and he starts to dream about Freddy Krueger, who wants to kill teens through Jesse. Jesse isn't sure what's happening until he finds Nancy's old diary and realizes who Freddy is, and that he plans to take over his body. Freddy is able to kill through Jesse, using him while he's asleep. Lisa, Jesse's love interest in this film, realizes that Jesse can stand up to Freddy and defeat him. Sorry, he, she believes that Jesse can stand up to Freddy and defeat him. So this is a very different idea than the first film, in that Freddy is killing more in the real world through Jesse. It's more of like a possession kind of a story. This film didn't have the maybe the impact or the popularity that the first one did, but it does have an interesting reputation. It was dubbed at the time, the, and this is a quote, the gayest horror film ever. And for that reason, has it's kind of taken on a cult status. It's probably less obvious to the current viewing eye, but the film has a bit of homoerotic subtext. Jessie is the scream queen of this film, a role that's more often played by a female. There's scenes of Jesse wandering naked, being in a gay bar, his high school coach kit his high school coach hits on him and is later killed by a spanking in the showers. And the way Lisa kind of makes moves on him and urges him to fight Freddy seems a little bit trying to convince the character to be straight. One scene, Jesse also runs away from Lisa and asks a male friend to stay awake with him in a scene that kind of could be interpreted a few ways. These are just some things. Most obviously, Patton had played a gay teen in his only previous film, which was Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. It's quite a title. Um, the actor Patton is gay, but was closeted at the time of the film. And notice that the way the film was being shot seemed to become more and more camp and homoerotic as the filming went on, often in ways that made him feel exposed, made fun of, um, uncomfortable, as though he was the butt of the joke. The experience effectively ended his acting career, partly because he was now typecast as gay in a time when there was a lot of homophobia, and partly because he was so uncomfortable with his experience on set and afterwards. And this makes me really sad. I think he's great in this film, and I think it's a real shame that this happened to him. The director has since come out and apologized for how Patton felt and the impact it had on him. So I think that's really nice. They're kind of he's acknowledged um, the whole situation. So I think you should watch this film as one of this actor's few performances. Though I did notice his IMDb shows that he starred in a few more horror films in more recent years, and I think that's awesome. So there's also more on this whole situation and on this film in the documentary Never Sleep Again, which is about this film series. The star power here is Jesse, played by Mark Patton. But there's also Hope Lang is also here. If you guys watch my um, videos on older films you may know of Hope Lang. Best death. There is a big scene with a pool party that's quite over the top and Freddy gets to really enjoy himself and menace everybody. Uh, but I think the death that stands out to me, it's, it's not actually a death, but Freddy emerges from Jesse's stomach and the effect that they use is really good. It's really gross. It's very uncanny and uncomfortable. And um, yeah, I think that's a really good moment in this film. It's a year later, 
Haunted by dreams of Freddy Krueger, Kristen's mother thinks she's suicidal and takes her to the Weston Hills Psychiatric Hospital. There she's under the care of Dr. Neil Gordon and a group of troubled teens, all of whom have had strange dreams and have sleep issues. Nancy is back. Now she's grown up and is an intern, and she recognizes what Kristen is going through, that Freddy is coming back. She realizes that all of the patients in the group are the last of the Elm Street kids and encourages the doctor to try some more unconventional therapies, during one of which we learn that Kristen has a special skill. She can pull other people into her dreams. This allows the teens to help each other confront Freddy as a group, but not before some of them are killed. We also learn a little bit of lore. Freddy's mother was a member of staff, or maybe a nun, who worked at the hospital in the asylum section and was accidentally locked in overnight in a ward of the criminally insane where she was sorry guys she was gang raped and became pregnant with a child who would be freddy we learn that the only way to really dispose of freddy so he can never come back is to destroy his bones so nancy's policeman father is back and in a crazy scene in a junkyard trying to destroy the bones in time to save the kids who are at the same time in the dream world with freddy this was Chuck Russell's directorial debut, and he went on to work on films like the Jim Carrey movie The Mask, and action films like Eraser, Collateral, and The Scorpion King. Wes Craven worked on the story idea this time, but he's not credited as the sole writer. So it's, yeah. Uh, this is one of the best films in the series. This is probably my favorite, along with the first one. Freddy really starts to come into his own here and has more lines, more vulgarity, more screen time, more elaborate ideas. But the acting is still really good and the plotting is coherent and there's good tension and pacing. So the star power in this movie is Patricia Arquette is in this movie. She is Kristen. I love Patricia Arquette. Uh, and then we have Lawrence Fishburne and Heather Langenkamp is back as Nancy. All the young cast in this are pretty good. There's also a tiny cameo with Zsa, Zsa Gabor where she's being interviewed on a talk show and Freddy like bursts in. Best death. This one is gross but Freddy turns Philip into a human puppet and makes him sleepwalk around the hospital to his death. Uh, yeah, Freddy starts to reappear in the dreams of the survivors of the last film, Kristen, Joey and Roland. Kristen, not played by Arquette this time, thinks that Freddy is coming back and she pulls her old pals into her dreams. They're pretty keen to dismiss her fears. So she starts to try to avoid sleeping, which means when they call for her help, when Freddy appears in their dreams, she's awake, can't help them, and Freddy is able to kill them. Later, her mother drugs her food to make her sleep, which I just think that's insane. In her sleep... Uh, he's able to get her to pull other people into the dream world where he can kill them. Um, so before he only had the link to his victims via them being Elm Street kids. So this is kind of how he can um, keep killing. Later, she is able to pass her powers on to Alice and Alice kind of inherits people's powers. This one's pretty forgettable on the whole and pretty dull my least favorite in the series it is kind of has the moniker of being very mtv in style which is a bit of a tonal shift this one was directed by rennie harlan of the long kiss goodnight and deep blue sea the most interesting star in this movie is a dog um and yeah best death joey in his waterbed I'm just going to leave it at that, but I don't know. It's just such a clever uh, sequence. Okay, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, 1989. Lisa Wilcox is back as Alice, and this time we have some baby and pregnancy themes. It feels like, to me, as franchises go on in horror, there's always some body horror around babies in one of the films. Here we go. Okay, Alice is dating Dan from the previous movie and she's about to graduate from high school when she starts to have strange visions of Freddy's mother and the asylum. A strange child who talks to her and other visions that lead her to understand that Freddy is coming back. 
we learn that she's pregnant and Freddie's hoping to come back through the unborn baby. Alice tells her friends and they don't really believe her, which is being believed or not being believed is part of the scary aspect of the Freddy Krueger kind of mythos in the films, which I think kind of works, you know, very well. I didn't worry too much about following the weird plot when I was watching this one. I just kind of enjoyed the ride. Um, it gets a little bit convoluted and that kind of thing, but you know, to me, this is the one that is the most MTV influenced it has a darker look overall, kind of a herald of the look that would come in in nineties horror, that kind of bluish filter. This one experienced a decline in profits compared to previous entries in the series. Though I think it's really interesting for its creative ideas and it's also better than the previous entry. The deaths here are far more bold, cartoonish, outlandish, and they're in that real silly 80s horror tone with practical effects that I think are really creative. Yeah, there's a little bit of stop motion in this movie and traditional animation. Uh, there's a sequence that's a little bit like the film clip for AHA's Take On Me, that song, if you know that one. In that one, the music clip a girl goes into a comic drawing. So here is one of the male characters that goes into a comic book. This one had various cuts to stop it from getting an X rating. People didn't really want X ratings in the 80s because it meant that your film wouldn't be shown in many places. People wouldn't be able to see it. So the script went through a few rewrites and that kind of adds to the slight incoherence along with things being cut. There are actually some unrated versions that were later released. This one's a fun watch. It's kind of a good, bad movie. So the star in this one that you might recognize is Whit Hertford. You may recognize this kid as the kid in Jurassic Park who's menaced by the raptor claw at the dig early in the film. Best death, Dan is fused with his motorcycle. Obviously, this is just what I think is a good death in this. You, you might like a different one. I just think it's weird and unexpected and I... I like that. Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, 1991. My cat just joined us. Grim is here listening. Probably not going to add an opinion at this late stage, but he did watch all of these films with me. What a trooper. Okay, it's 10 years later and Freddy has killed nearly every child in Springwood, Ohio. And at this point, I kind of wonder why aren't the FBI involved? Like if all the kids in this town are killed, Surely there would be a lot of interest in this place of like what is going on. But anyway, I don't know. John Doe wakes up with amnesia outside the city limits of Springwood. And when he's taken to a shelter for teens, Dr. Maggie finds a newspaper clipping about the town in his pocket. So she decides that taking him to the town where all of the kids have been murdered is a great idea. And that's going to jog his memory. Other teens from the shelter tag along. The kids that try to leave, the kids that tag along try to leave the town and they can't find their way out. And while that's going on, John finds out that Freddy actually had a child and he may be that child. So we learn more about Freddy's life before the movies, from being abused as a kid to being powered by demons, which is why he keeps coming back. This feels like backstory to me that we didn't really need, but it's fine. Some of the teens are killed later and we learn that Maggie herself is actually the child and she confronts her father, Freddy, and kills him permanently, kind of. So this one was meant to be the end of the cycle, uh, though of course it, it's not really. It is the finale of the 80s cycle. The later films are a bit different, different tone, different style. That will all make sense when I talk about them. Um, but interestingly, this one was directed by Rachel Talalay, who is a film professor at UBC here in Canada. So that's kind of cool. And when she was married in 1990, you may have heard of John Waters and he officiated at her wedding. So she was a little influenced by Twin Peaks, which was on TV at the time. And the director wanted to inject the surreal and the humorous back into the film. Uh, Maggie, at, so at the end of the film, there's a sequence and the character Maggie puts on 3D glasses to fight Freddy. So this was to cue the audience that the rest of the film from that point on was going to be 3D. So if you're in cinema, you would watch that last, you'd put your 3D glasses on then. 
So not all of the releases of this on like VHS, DVD, whatever, not all of them have this 3D segment at the end of the film. So, um, I mean, that's kind of all I have to say about that. <laughs> Just that it's an interesting thing. There wasn't any cuts for ratings in this film, but there is a longer cut that you can watch with more material. It was just cut out for time constraint, but it does, there are certain moments that have continuity issues because of those bits being cut. Um, yeah, and this was intended as the last movie. So as a publicity stunt, the studio held a funeral for Freddy and a bunch of the actors from previous films came and it was like just a bit of fun, but this was criticized as glorifying mass murderers, apparently. So even though Freddy isn't real, that's how some people felt. Um, yeah, personally, I don't mind this movie. It's not a favorite. It's not the worst. Um, Freddy has pretty much jumped the shark at this point, and that's kind of part of the fun of the film. The stars and cameos in this one, uh, Brecken Mayer is in this film. You might not recognize his name, but I just remember him being in so many films in the late 90s and early 2000s. So he's very, his performance in this is very of that time for me. He often plays like a kind of skater with an undercut haircut. There's also cameo appearances by Johnny Depp, Roseanne Barr, Tom Arnold, Alice Cooper, and the credit song is by Iggy Pop. So there you go. The best death for me is Spencer being sucked into a video game. It's very of its time in the best possible way. And I just think it's kind of fun. Wes Craven years earlier had an idea about making a Freddy Krueger film that was kind of meta. The script was rejected a bunch of times, but in 1994, meta was in and this film got greenlit with Craven writing and directing. Because of the nature of this story, it's not part of the same continuity as the other films. That will kind of make sense in a second. So in this film, Freddy is a fictional movie character who invades the real world of the film and goes after the cast and crew who worked on the movie about him. So it's a movie around the original movie. This is an odd idea on paper, but it is a novel idea. Craven took Freddy and stripped him back a little, updating his look slightly and taking him back to being more haunting and dark and less comical and silly. Heather Langenkamp is back. She plays herself as a woman who lives as an actress who lives in LA with a son and her husband, Chase. Chase has been working on a new nightmare on Elm Street movie and people in the world of the film recognize her as Nancy from the original film. As Freddy starts to kill people who worked on the original movie, she goes to see Wes Craven, who admits that he dreamt, dreamt about Freddy before making the film and that that character is actually a supernatural entity that used him to make the film so he could enter the real world. Heather has to become Nancy in order to save her child and everyone she knows from Freddy being able to enter the world completely. The film has scenes, ideas, and references from the original, and this one was liked by critics, but it is actually, I, from what I could tell, this is the lowest grossing film. It's a hard film to describe because it's like a film about another film, uh, and it feels very, very 90s in a good way, but I like that it's playing with expectations and breaking the mold. This movie is 100% the ancestor to Scream, and it was very much a Wes Craven-esque movie. So the star power here is Heather Langenkamp as Nancy and herself. Robert Englund is here as himself. Miko Hughes is Dylan, Heather's son in the movie. You're going to recognize him because he was Gage in Pet Cemetery. And John Saxon, who played Nancy's policeman dad, is here. Wes Craven is here as himself. Robert Shea makes an appearance. Um, Lynn Shea is here for a little bit. And a few of the characters from earlier films are scattered about within this film, just in silent parts. So that's kind of interesting. I don't have like a favorite death from this one because it's just not that kind of a film. I guess the title here is pretty apt. The idea of who would win in a fight between various horror franchise killers 
is always a fun debate, and this film is a crossover with the Friday the 13th franchise, and an attempt to answer that question, who would win between Freddy or Jason? I do have a post about the Jason Voorhees movies. I mentioned it above. It will be linked below if you want to take a look at the watch guide that I made for that. That was another really good fun one to make. Uh, yeah, so the plot. Freddy is pretty weak after people have stopped believing in him and the townspeople are aware that they can take a drug to stop them from dreaming. So he's kind of powerless. So he decides to enlist Jason Voorhees by impersonating his mother in a dream and manipulating him into killing Springwood teens. As the killing gets going, fears emerge that Freddy is back, allowing him to grow stronger. And meanwhile, some kids from the local asylum escape to try and rescue their friends and family in the burbs. Freddy finds it hard to control Jason, of course, and eventually we get the teens with a plan to get the two entities to fight each other and kill each other. This is Robert Englund's final cinematic appearance as Freddy, so far at least. Jason Voorhees was recast as uh, by Ken Kiringer because the director wanted a different physicality from Kane Hodder, who was the Jason in the Jason suit for the previous four films. There was a plan to have more of these franchise crossovers. You may be aware of Alien vs Predator, for example. But this film got really mixed reviews and some of those plans were scrapped. So I know this isn't a popular opinion, but I actually kind of like this movie. It's not terrible, it's well paced, and I just really like the very 2003 of it all. The star power in this movie, you'll get a few faces you recognize. Kelly Rowland of Destiny's Child is probably the one where you're like the most surprised to see her. Uh, Catherine Isabel of Ginger Snaps is here, and Jason Ritter is here. The best death is a scene with a rave in the cornfield, which is just funny to me. Like, why would there be a rave in a cornfield? This is just something very outside of my experience. Um, but yeah, it feels very of its time, and it has a pretty good sequence of deaths in this scene. It's just the rave scene is very 2003. In 2010, the franchise apparently felt right for a reboot, and this film was made. It was Samuel Bayer, his debut film as a director, and Jackie Earl Haley, who had auditioned for a role in the very first film, was brought in to play Freddy. This film had Michael Bay as one of the producers, and the whole feel of the whole film is very much gritty 2010s realism kind of style. Essentially, the film is a remake of the first film or follows it fairly closely in a lot of ways. A group of teens start to have strange dark dreams and then they start to die as Freddy kills them in their sleep. As the film progresses, we learn that they don't remember that they were all at kindergarten together where Freddy molested them and now he's killing them off in their dreams to revenge himself on the parents who lynched him. While the first film had a strong slasher element, this one adds in a bit of a sort of mystery style plot as the teens have to find the clues as to who Freddy is and how to stop him before they're all killed. It feels odd not having Robert England in the role, but the whole vibe of the film is different, so it's fine. And I think Jackie Earl Haley does look really great in the makeup that they have for him. It's a little bit different and he plays a version of Freddy that's his own and that really works. On the whole, though, this film isn't pacey enough and the characters feel undeveloped and unsympathetic somehow. It just all feels very flat. The mystery element doesn't really pay off either because who doesn't know who Freddy Krueger is? So while they're trying to figure it out, we already know. I don't know. It's just a bit dull and it never quite gels, but it kind of looks good. The star power in this film, this one has quite a few. There's Rooney Mara, Kyle Gallner, Kellen Lutz, Clancy Brown, Connie Britton. Um, yeah. Best Death. This one is more about the realism, I guess. So it's not really the extravagant deaths. Um, but I will say seeing the events of Freddy Krueger being killed by the parents in the town, which we don't really, we just get, we just hear the story in the first one. That's probably the most kind of dramatic scene in the film. Editor's note, TV series, 
Freddy's Nightmares 1988 title card. Horror franchises often have a lot of spin-off media and merchandise, and Nightmare on Elm Street is no different, with books and comics, etc. But the TV series deserves special mention because it starred Robert England as Freddy in the show. Freddy's Nightmares was a TV series that ran for two seasons, from 1988 to 1990, with a total of 44 episodes. The show has Freddy as a host, introducing each episode, and seems to have been inspired a bit by Tales from the Crypt, but it's kind of less witty and punny. The show's first episode, directed by Toby Hooper, was the story of Freddy being tried and acquitted, prompting his lynching by the townspeople, the film's backstory, basically. From there, each episode featured two stories set in the Springwood, Ohio of the, of the movies, with some of them featuring Freddy as the villain. The second story in an episode often follows or builds around a minor character in the first story, which is kind of clever, and some stories have links or story arcs over a few episodes. A uh, little interesting fact, the high school used as a location in this series was later also used in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This series looks very 80s and kind of low budget or TV budget. It's very cheesy, though I think it was actually quite expensive to make. Um, I didn't actually watch all of the series in fairness, but it's one of those series that's just fun to watch and kind of spot the stars who would go on to bigger things later on. And there's quite a lot of them. Or just for the 80s horror TV kind of vibes of it all. The stories are okay. They're not always very coherent and they're often quite repetitive. The content of the series meant that it was often heavily edited to be able to be shown on TV. In one case, almost 10 minutes of one story was cut. The documentary Never Sleep Again from 2010 has a lot of interviews with people who worked on this show and has some outtakes too. So if you're interested that would be a good place to go. This is one where I think if you can find it and watch some episodes, why not? But it's not really a must see necessarily. Um, I think it would kind of be one of those things where you could just put it on in the background of um, like a Halloween party or something and just kind of watch bits of it. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else does that with movies, but I do sometimes. And that's it. Well, that was a journey. Uh, I'm kind of tired now. So I hope you got a kick out of this because it was really fun to watch all of these and share them with you guys. There are also a couple of documentaries I mentioned. There are more documentaries than the ones I mentioned. There are books, fiction and nonfiction and all kinds of things about this film. Like there's so much about this fi these films that I just couldn't include everything. So I think some of you will probably be annoyed that I didn't mention something. That's totally fine. I would really like to know your favorite of these films. I'm not going to hate if you loved or hated one. Like maybe your favorite one is the one I don't like. That's that's normal. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear in the comments or if you have a favorite scene, because obviously sometimes what was striking to me, you know, that might not be your favorite. So please let me know in the comments. I just love to hear what you kind of love about these films. Um, oh yeah, if there's something you want to add to share about these films that I didn't mention, like there's so many interesting facts around these movies in the comments, I will read them. It will be very interesting for me. Yeah. So as I said, there are loads of little facts about these films. I just couldn't include everything. So yeah. Uh, thank you for watching. I always appreciate it. I have a lot of fun sharing all this stuff with you guys. I have my socials linked below and yeah, if you like, comment, or subscribe, I know everybody already, or always asks people to do that, but it does actually help. And yeah, I am going to bed now. So <laughs> pleasant dreams, kids. <laughs>